In July of 1961, Stanley Milgram, who was a psychologist at Yale, decided to do a study. He got a group of people together and then paired them off. One part of the pair was considered a teacher, while the other part of the pair was considered a learner. He would then give them a list of words to memorize. These words were randomized like red hammer. He then put the teacher in one room and the learner in another room. The teacher was then expected to uh, say the first part of the uh, word, like red, and then the student was supposed to say the other part from memory, like hammer. So if the teacher said red, the learner was expected to say hammer. If they did not get the word right, the teacher would deliver a punishment in form of a shock. At first, it started really low at first, but every time the learner got the word wrong, the shock would go up by 15 volts. At about 150 volts is when the learner started having a reaction to these volts. They were saying that they were in pain. Anywhere from 150 to 330, the learner would start saying that they did not want to participate anymore because it hurt too much. Any time the learner uh, said that they wanted to discontinue the study, the teacher was encouraged to deliver another punishment. And every time the shock would go up 15 more. Even if it looked like the teacher did not want to shock the learner, they were encouraged to do so. After 330 volts was reached, the learner would often stop responding completely, and when they did that, they would be delivered another 15 more volts of shock. What the teacher didn't know is that there was no shock actually being delivered to anybody. This was all just an experiment. But what was shocking about the results is that there was 65% of the teachers who went on to 450 volts of electricity being sent to the learner when they made a mistake. It was all just an experiment to see how far people would go in order to be compliant with an authority figure. And like I said, 65% of them went all the way up to 450 volts, despite there being no reaction from the learner. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to have you today. And if you are returning, thanks so much for coming back. I'm excited to see you again. On my channel, we talk about a true crime case, something that just I thought was interesting this week. And so if that's something you might be interested in, you can go ahead and hit the little subscribe button down below as well as the bell icon so you can be notified when I upload. I do want to give a quick warning that these are real cases with real people. So please do not remove yourself from the situation. Understand that we are talking about real people and some of these people are still alive today and uh, are still affected by what happened. So always remember to remain respectful and kind because you never know who is watching and you never know who is listening. So please remember to just stay kind and uh, don't remove yourself from the situation. Make sure you understand that this is a very real story. With all of that being said, let's go ahead and jump into today's story. This case does not start in 2004, but the most prominent part of the case did happen in 2004, so that's where we're going to start. Louise Ogborn was uh, living in Mount Washington, Kentucky. Her mom had just recently had some health issues and that caused her to lose her job, so Louise, being the ever helpful daughter, decided to take a job at the local McDonald's to help her family make ends meet. Louise was the kind of person that enjoyed her work. She was early, she would always help out. And if somebody called out, she was always willing to jump in and help um, her employers out. On April 9th of 2004, it was no different. Somebody had called out and so Louise had offered to stay longer. She did wanna clock out real quick and grab a bite to eat. And then she was gonna jump back into the thick of things so that she could help out until someone was able to come and relieve her. Donna Summers was the manager that was on duty that night. There was another manager there as well, but she was uh, expected to leave any time. It was a busy Friday night, and Donna all of a sudden received a call from someone named Officer Scott. Officer Scott said that he was on the line with someone from McDonald's corporate and also her manager, and that they suspe suspected one of their employees of uh, stealing from a customer that had been in earlier that day. 
Officer Scott gave a vague description that seemed to match Louise. Donna then asked Louise to come into the office so that they could chat a little bit further. Officer Scott told uh, Donna that they did have a police officer that was on the way and that they would be there any time, but that Louise would need to be strip searched. Officer Scott said that they could do this at the police department, but if Donna wanted to help them out, they could just go ahead and get the strip search over there. Donna Summers and the other uh, manager were in the back room with Louise. They slowly started asking Louise to take off her clothes, and each time she would take off an article of clothing, Donna would take it and shake it out to see if she could find anything, and then she would put it in a garbage bag. This would go on until Louise was completely nude. She had no clothes on whatsoever. Donna then, at the instruction of Officer Scott, took the uh, bag of clothes and also Louise's keys took them to Donna's car and locked them up. So this left Louise completely vulnerable. They did give her a small apron to try to cover up, but it hardly covered up uh, Louise's body at all. Eventually the other manager did have to leave. So this just left Donna and Louise in the back room by themselves. The door was shut. So only Louise and Donna could see what was going on, but there was surveillance footage being uh, recorded at the time. At this point, Donna and Louise have been on the phone for a while and Donna needs to get back to work. It's a busy Friday night. She needs to get back to work. And so the officer says that they have somebody coming. They're just shorthanded and just to just hang, bear with him for a little bit, but he does ask if there's anyone else that can come watch Louise while they're waiting on the other officers to arrive. Louise pulls a cook from the line. His name was Jason Bradley. He, she asked Jason to come watch Louise, but as soon as he starts listening to Officer Scott's demands, he absolutely refuses to have anything to do with it and decides to leave Louise back there alone. But this would leave Donna to be back there with Louise herself. This is when Officer Scott asks if there's anybody else, any other man in her life that she trusts, and Donna immediately thinks of her fiance, Walter Nix. Walter Nix is a 40-something year old exterminator. He has no affiliation to McDonald's. The only affiliation he has that he's going to marry Donna. But Donna asks if Walter can come watch Louise and he agrees. Once Walter arrives, Donna then leaves to go back to work and that leaves just Walter and Louise in the back room by herself. And remember, Louise is still completely naked with just the apron. But as soon as Donna leaves, the officer Scott tells uh, Walter that he wants Donna to take the apron off and start doing things like jumping jacks, running in place, standing on a chair. The uh, officer says that something might fall out and that they need to do this in order to make sure that Louise is completely free of this $50 that was stolen earlier in the day. Walter complies with uh, Officer Scott's demands and he has Louise do all of this in front of him completely naked. Donna would sometimes come into the office unexpectedly and each time Donna came in, Officer Scott instructed Walter to throw Louise the apron and sit back in place so that Donna would not know what was going on. And you would think that at this point, Walter would be like, okay, something's not completely right here, but it would continue to go on. There was one time that um, Walter did not throw the apron to Louise in time and Donna did come in on Louise completely naked again without the apron covering herself. And Donna seemed to have absolutely no reaction. There are certain times where Donna would come in and you can see Louise like putting her head on Donna's shoulder and she's begging her to get her out of the situation. But Donna completely ignores this and continues to let this go on. Every time Donna would leave, the requests would get more and more ridiculous. Officer Scott tells Walter to smell Louise's breath because he'll be able to see if she was drinking or if there was any drugs on her breath. He then instructs uh, Louise to kiss Walter on the cheek. Any time Louise would, would not call Walter sir, Officer Scott would instruct Walter to spank Louise. This was more of a beating. Sometimes it would go on for 10 whole minutes and when Walter was done, you, can, you could see visible welts on Louise's body. This was not, this was just disgusting behavior, but it would get even worse when the caller asked for Louise to perform oral sex on Walter. And at this point, you would think that Walter would be like, okay, something very weird is going on. This is not a police officer I'm talking to, but he doesn't and he allows Louise to perform 
oral sex on him. And it's only after that that Walter says that this is weird and he leaves. <laughs> and then allegedly he calls a friend and says, I've done something very wrong. But again, this leaves Donna alone with Louise and she needs someone to watch her, but she also needs to get back to work. She looks out into the uh, restaurant and she sees Thomas Sims sitting there. Thomas Sims is a um, maintenance man for McDonald's. He's off duty, but he's just in there trying to get some dessert. And she asked Thomas to come sit in with Louise. Thomas refused to go along with any of the demands that Officer Scott was making and he instructs Donna that this there's something very wrong about the situation and that's the first time that Donna thinks to herself like hmm there is something wrong with this situation and she finally decides to call her manager who's apparently on this phone call to see what exactly is going on and when she calls her manager she realizes that her manager has been sleeping this entire time and that she was never on the phone call and that she has no clue about anyone that stole any kind of money from the restaurant. So it's been almost three hours at this point and Donna finally calls the real police. They hang up on Officer Scott and then somebody had the idea to call Star 69 so they could get the number that had called them. When the real police finally arrived, it was Detective Buddy Stump that came. Detective Buddy Stump is a rookie at the time and he didn't really have much to go on at all. He did have the phone number that this person had called from and he also had the surveillance footage that was taken from the office. He watched the surveillance footage in its entirety and he immediately realized that something was very wrong with the situation. But other than that there was really just nothing. He did think that maybe this was a disgruntled employee or maybe it could be somebody that had a grudge against Louise or something like that, but he just, he didn't really know what exactly was going on. He also did find a payphone that was right across the street from the McDonald's and he figured that the call was probably made from that payphone so that the person could surveil the McDonald's and also see if police were coming in and out but there was no solid proof of that. But at the end, Buddy was coming up with very, very little evidence. So finally, he just decided to Google it and see if anybody else had had a similar experience of any kind. And what he found was absolutely shocking. From 1994 up until 2004, when this one took place, there were multiple restaurants that had made a police reports with the same exact MO. It was at Taco Bell's, Burger King's, Wendy's, Hardee's, Applebee's. I mean, it was all over the country as well that these reports were coming in. Most of the time it involved an officer calling and saying that they suspected somebody of something and that this person needed to be strip searched. It wasn't just employees that this was happening to either. This was also customers. Like there was two girls that were at a Taco Bell and they were customers and this happened to them. But the most chilling part about all of this evidence was that this was happening to young girls, minor girls, one as young as 14 years old. These girls were expected to strip down to nothing and then they were asked to stand in degrading poses and expose themselves in ways that was absolutely traumatizing. Buddy was absolutely determined to solve this case, but he had so very little to go on. So he looked to the number that had called the restaurant and that's when he was able to find out that that number had actually came from a prepaid AT&T phone card. So he was able to trace that number all the way to Panama City Beach, Florida. With no other leads to go on, Buddy decided to call the Panama City Police Department. Now the Panama City didn't have any idea when it came to the case, they didn't have any additional evidence that Buddy could use, but they had heard of other police departments that were investigating very similar crimes. That's when the Panama City Police Department gave uh, Buddy the number to Detective Victor Flattery. Victor was looking at very similar incidents that had happened in the Massachusetts area where he was from, but the difference was is that he was he was investigating four phone calls that had happened in the same night at different locations in Massachusetts, four different Wendy's locations in Massachusetts. 
Victor had a little bit more evidence though because Victor was able to determine that this was all that these calls were also made with a AT&T prepaid phone card. He was able to trace where this part the particular phone card that had happened on his cases where it was bought from. He then called that Walmart and asked for their surveillance footage but he when he got their surveillance footage it wasn't footage of the registers. He knew the exact date and the time that this phone card was bought but when they didn't have surveillance footage of the registers like he didn't know what the suspect looked like he didn't know what the voice sounded like so this considering that they hadn't that they didn't have any surveillance footage of the registers and just like the parking lot it would kind of flip in between the parking lot and grocery and electronics like it would just flip through that wasn't any help to him. But soon they realized that Buddy's phone card was bought at a different Walmart location in Panama Beach, Florida. So they called that Walmart and they were able to find out that they did have surveillance footage of the register area. They again knew what the date and time that this phone card had been bought. So they looked at the register and finally caught the first visual sight of the suspect that they were ever going to see. They had a very clear image of this guy's face and they also noticed that he was wearing very specific pants. They kind of had a line going through them and I hope to find a picture of that. And they recognized this as police issued pants. So they immediately thought that their suspect was a police officer. This was the biggest break that they had received so far. So they immediately decided that both Buddy and Victor were gonna go to Panama Beach, Florida and go talk to the police departments there because they surely would recognize this guy. But when they got to the police department in Panama City, the uh, officers there said that, no, that's not an officer, we don't recognize him. And that's also not a police uniform. That's a correctional officer uniform. There were three different jails in Panama City. So they decided to just go one by one because surely somebody would recognize this guy if they just went to the um, prison and asked around. The first one that they went to, they had no luck. Nobody knew who he was. But the second one that they went to, the second jail that they went to, this person was immediately recognized by his superiors. Not only did they get a name, but they also found out that their suspect was working at the jail at the very moment that they were there. And his name was David R. Stewart. David Stewart was a 38 year old man, married, five kids, seemed perfectly normal. Like nobody ever would have thought this about him at all. So it was honestly shocking when he, when Victor and Buddy asked if they could speak to him. When Buddy and Victor finally sat down with David, they asked him, do you have any idea why we might be here? And, Vic and David said, no, I have no idea. David was calm and collected the entire time that he was talking to Victor and Buddy and didn't seem to give any indication that he was the caller, the scam caller. And at the very end of the conversation, he said, thank God it's over. And no one really knows if he's talking about the phone calls being done or the interview being done, but either way, this was enough for Victor and Buddy to get a search warrant for his house. And in David's house, they found guns, they found police paraphernalia, they found training manuals for police officers. So it really seemed like David had always wanted to be a police officer. And not only that, they found that David was actually a volunteer uh, deputy. Uh, he would work part-time for some smaller departments. And he had... Um, applied for several deputy positions throughout Florida and it just seemed like it was never within reach like he was never actually able to become a police self officer. In June of 2004, Buddy was able to extradite David back to Kentucky to face charges. There was some complication because at the end of the day, even if David was the one making the phone calls, he wasn't the one acting out these crimes. And so they really didn't know how to charge him or how to make sure that the charges were the maximum that they could give him. But they ended up charging David with a solicitation of sodomy and um, impersonating a police officer. If convicted, David was looking at up to 15 years in prison, which personally I don't think is nearly enough because this man did some absolutely heinous things and I think he should have spent the rest of his life in prison, but that's just me. His brother was actually the one that got him the attorney that he would use in the trial and um, in the documentary, because there is a documentary on Netflix I highly suggest watching, but in the documentary, the lawyer is asked if he thinks that David is innocent and in typical attorney fashion, he says, well, I know for a fact he's not guilty, which I think is just a really 
it's, it's a yes or no question, sir. You know what I mean? Sadly, in October of 2006, David was acquitted of all charges. The jury said that there was just way too many questions left unanswered, and so they could not in good conscience convict David of the crimes that most think he had committed. The prosecution strongly believes the fact that David's voice was never recorded in one of these phone calls really um, worked against their favor because nobody, like there was, there was no evidence that David, there was no solid evidence that it was David. Like no one knew what this person's voice sounded like because it was only the victims who knew what his voice sounded like. Now, David still does remain a suspect in multiple of these calls uh, that happened across the country. Um, and it's also important to note that these phone calls have completely stopped since David faced uh, ch charges in Kentucky. So do with that information what you will. There are a few other charges that happened in the Mount Washington case. Walter Nix was charged with um, SA uh, sexual misconduct and unlawful imprisonment. He did uh, agree to testify against David and uh, he was given a plea for that. He was sentenced to five years in prison. Because of the plea deal, he was only given five years. Donna Summers would end up ending her engagement to Walter Nix, and she was also fired from McDonald's. But she she was fired for allowing a non-employee into the office and for allowing the strip, strip shirt the strip search to happen. McDonald's apparently had a policy put in place that no employee was ever allowed to be strip searched and since Donna had allowed this to happen, she was let go from her job. Uh, Donna was also charged with unlawful imprisonment and eventually she would take what's called an Alford plea. In an Alford plea, the defendant is basically able to maintain their innocence while also admitting that the prosecution has enough evidence to fully convict them. Donna was given one year in prison and yeah, so there's that. Louise though, Louise would end up suing McDonald's for $200 million. Um, I think she had every right to that lawsuit and I'm really glad that she went ahead and decided to go with that lawsuit. She sued on the basis that these hoax phone calls had ho happened at multiple McDonald's locations across the country and McDonald's apparently did not call and tell anybody about it. Uh, the manager that was working at that McDonald's did say that there was a brief and very vague voicemail left on her phone about these um, hoax phone calls, but there was never any like warning put out by McDonald's that this is a possibility that it might happen. But Louise argued that had they let everybody know that the, these phone calls could possibly happen, it wouldn't have happened to her and they would have been more prepared. McDonald's defense was that they had strict policies in place that did not allow employees to be strip searched and uh, that should have prevented uh, Louise from being strip searched. They also argued that Walter Nix was not an employee of McDonald's so McDonald's should not be held liable for his actions. And they also argued that Louise had never physically removed herself from the situation even though Donna had taken her clothes and her keys and locked them up in her own personal vehicle. And uh, Louise you know, she was left in between a rock and a hard place. I mean, sure, she could have ran through a busy restaurant completely naked, but she, I can completely understand why Louise felt like she was stuck there because she was, she was stuck there 100%. The jury would side with Louise in this uh, lawsuit and she was awarded $6.1 million. Of course, McDonald's would appeal this uh, verdict and uh, eventually they would come to a settlement of $1.1 million, which I don't think is nearly enough for what Louise went through. And after this, McDonald's revamped their policy and their training. So there is that. There are several other cases that you could listen to when it comes to um, these these hoax calls. There was another victim that was an employee at a Taco Bell and she also tried suing but was uh, not given anything. She lost her lawsuit and the uh, judge in her case said something along the lines of, I hope she makes better decisions. So I highly recommend you watch the documentary on Netflix. It's called Don't Pick Up the Phone. It was about three episodes, about an hour each. I highly recommend watching it because there's so many more details in that. But 
absolutely I'm absolutely dying to know what you all think about this the study that I was talking about earlier I mean I think that just shows just how far people will go when they think that they're being compliant but at what point do you finally think like something really weird is going on here and I probably need to put a stop to it that was my question through the whole thing like how did nobody think that this is weird like we need to look a little further like maybe just call our police department and see if this is actually happening I don't know but I'm genuinely curious about your thoughts on this case let me know down in the comments but that's pretty much all I have for you today I hope this finds you so safe and so well and I love you all very much and I will see you next week